uh, just there we go. So lovely. Okay, thank you, thank you, Andy Swell. Thank you for the for the inter, uh, intro and for the panel discussion so far. I think we had a good lineup of speakers, and um, what we'd like to do in this session is really, um, you know, take you and and, and discuss some of the the challenges um, that we currently experiencing on AI. Let me give you an introduction. My name is Abdul Baba. I'm basically um, in the industry. I am a CIO uh, for League of Companies. I'm also non non executive director for Computer Aid International. I also started up my own company called Technolo Technologic Innovations, where we focus on um, you know uh, up starting um, well investing in um, you know industrial revolution type uh, applications going forward. So I'd like to take this opportunity now to um, you know invite. Uh, to the to the panel, um, I've got an exciting lineup. Uh, I must say, I've got uh, individuals from from um, the t t industry, from cloud to private sector. So, I'd like to introduce the panel. I have Gregory Melson, uh, a technology consultant in the industry. Gregory, are you there? Yes, I'm here, and thank you, Abdul, for the introduction. Um, Excellent, great. Excellent, thanks, Gregory. Kevin Derman from uh, Cascade Cloud. Um, Kevin. Yes. Hi, Abdul. Nice, nice to be on the panel with everyone today. It's been some great presentations so far. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Derek Wilcox from Discovery, the CIO for Discovery. Derek, are you online? Hi, uh, Abdul. Very uh, nice to be there we go. Nice to meet you, Derek. The last day is Peter van Yesen from Genesis. Uh, are, you, are you there, Peter? I'm here. Thank you very much, Abdul, and uh, happy to be on the panel and to discuss very interesting things today. Excellent. I'm really happy on the lineup and thought with, um, I'd like to ask, get, get Peter on and really talk about, um, you know, let's talk about, you know, the difference between understanding of AI. Um, currently, you know, the machine learning and deep learning, uh, one of the success factors actually, um, uh, McKinsey has indicated one of the success factors in AI basically is really to understand what AI is and really understand what it means. So um, together with that, you know, um, the, having a true better business case uh, around AI. So Peter, if you can just give us an understanding of, of what the elements of AI, what does it mean between deep learning, machine learning, and what AI is, before we can go into contextualize the discussion of where we are from an AI perspective, if you don't, if you well, start. Yeah, yeah, so if, uh, if from our side uh, perspective, it's really, whew, uh, I think it's such a broad concept to try to, to bring it down to that level. But in, in Genesis perspective, it's really applying uh, machine learning, sequence learning, all of those uh, different types of algorithms to data. So when it, when it, what it all boils down to is data. Um, and then obviously the compute on top of that in order to process to all of that data to leverage those insights out of that data. So we can see uh, you know, the big players like Microsoft and SAP and Salesforce, they're all starting to open, well, I suppose not all of them. One is op starting the open data initiative and another one is starting um, uh, another cloud information model where it's all about standardization of data because um, for uh, machine learning and deep learning and, and data science, all of that to take place, you have to have standards in data in order to understand it properly. Um, and that's where everything is going from, from my perspective. So it's really you know, leveraging those standard data um, apply computing algorithms to that and to leverage uh, and then leverage the insights out of that for a specific purpose. Now, the, I think one thing that, um, that might not be clear in all circumstances in the general, um, you know, in general uh, walk of life is AI is not just, you know, a, a robot and you ask it something and it answers you. It, at this point in time, it's applied to specific problems. Um, give it a problem and it'll work out an answer to it. It's not give it any problem and it'll give you an answer. Not, not yet, when we get yeah. to um, general intelligence and then later on to super intelligence, that's a different story. But for now it's applied to specific problems um, and to do that it needs the data to understand the trends and, uh, um, and you know, the, the insights to get the insights out of that. So uh, that's basically where we are at the moment from, uh, I suppose from a genesis perspective. Okay, perfect. Uh, Peter, you have very given introduction, so, so thank you for that in your previous presentation. So um, mm -hmm. uh, let me get to, 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 to Kevin. Kevin, um, let me contextualize and maybe just introduce yourself as you start, but the question that I'd like to address is, with COVID and where we are in the industry right now, all the companies are really on a backtrack in terms of the investment, in terms of the project, um, in terms of really taking a step back, looking at the budget, 
trying to understand exactly what are priorities and what is must-haves, um, taking a step back around future growth and looking at survival right now. Um, and AI, like fourth industrial evolution, you know, I've been also heading up IT for a telecommunications company last year. AI wasn't, wasn't a, a priority, right? It wasn't a priority on the board. Um, however, COVID has now completely changed that scenario in terms of moving to the cloud, which creates different opportunity, different budgets. From your perspective, um, can you just give us an understanding how AI um, right now, where AI is from a cloud perspective? Um, and, and what do you think um, the approach is right now with companies and where companies are right now and where are they starting and what, how are they realigning their strategies? Because right now the business is, strategy is changing and they have to, IT is at the back and need to align to the business. So if you can give us that little bit uh, understanding of where to start, what has happened, where are we, how can we approach II in such a way that we can mitigate COVID, not mitigate COVID, but try to address and uh, still achieve business, business value and achieve business uh, objectives right now. Okay, um, certainly. Wow, Abdul, it was a lot of questions in one. So I will try and attempt to uh, be uh, as concise as I can with all, with all of that. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Derman. I'm the CEO of a company, Cascade.cloud. And uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is one of my personal passions and uh, really, really enjoy the potential that it brings to the business environment. Um, so firstly, I think a lot, a lot of companies were caught um, unawares with COVID, and I think that's the first thing to do. And they were caught unaware on their digita digitization journey. So they felt that they, they had the time to do it. They were on this digital path. There was no sense of urgency uh, with that. And, uh, and what happened is many companies all of a sudden had to go remote immediately and they found that they hadn't made that cloud journey. They hadn't migrated many of their workloads to the cloud. And so they suffered from, uh, from that. So I think in terms of priorities, many companies um, are reprioritizing to make sure that they get that right first so that they know that should something like this happen again they are prepared and they are able to uh, be um, mobile and uh, and have their uh, be able to have their workforce work from anywhere and at any time and have access to all the systems cloud in terms of ai is a, a fantastic enabler i, I really think that um, part of the uh, almost like the democratization of ai is due to cloud technology and is due in part to the large hyperscalers so when you look at the hyperscalers in terms of cloud we're talking about amazon web services we're talking about google cloud we're talking about the likes of microsoft and azure and that platform uh, what that has enabled them to do is whereby in the past um, artificial intelligence and machine learning was really only the domain of the large enterprise companies. It has now taken it that the small, when we're talking about mid-market companies and we're even looking at SMB companies, they can take part in this and they have access to this exact same type of technology that the large enterprises have. So I think we are dealing with a situation whereby companies experienced uh, the issue of COVID, they are now looking to do two things. They're either wanting to cut costs and ensure that they're not caught unaware again, or they're trying to look for new avenues of revenue. How do they catch up the lost ground that has happened during this particular period? And artificial intelligence in many different forms gives them that opportunity to, uh, to do that, whether it's utilizing things like recommendation engines, whether it's chatbots. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've called many companies during this time where the message that I get is due to COVID-19, our offices are closed. Uh, mm -hmm. Please email us should you wish to speak to us. Now that could have easily have been replaced by an AI chatbot that mm -hmm. could have directed the call, could have fielded the query, and uh, they could use that. And that kind of technology is available to companies large and small. Okay, and, and the adoption of, of cloud and AI in terms of uh, with your other customers, do you see that it has increased slightly during this period? Um, yeah, so certainly cloud has. I think the AI journey, as, as many of the presenters have um, indicated, is 
fairly advanced in the enterprise uh, world within South Africa and Africa. But when you look at that mid-market segment and you just move down, they're really only starting the journey. Um, from a cloud perspective, uh, we have adoption rates um, that are around about 77%. That was the last my broadband um, uh, review that, that uh, came up with that. But when you look at what companies are actually utilizing for, a lot of it is for backup and disaster recovery. And that's okay. really what I would consider to be a really basic use case for cloud. Uh, you want to get to the things yeah. like serverless technology, you want to use the AI, the machine learning, that's how you really take advantage of the benefits that cloud has to offer. Okay, brilliant, Kevin. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to get to Gregory. Um, Gregory, I think, uh, let's just chat to around AI, right? So what's happening right now with a lot of companies, they are trying to build on their old systems, which is actually a problem right now because they need to be in the level of modernization where they have uh, the like of IT as a service or their, modern, their system is more modernized to start speaking to the likes of IoT and AI. Just from your perspective, what is, what is the, where, where do we start with AI, right? Um, what is your approach in terms of AI? Um, right now, companies are really struggling to modernize their systems. Um, some constraints are uh, legacy applications and you know, they're trying to get out of that and modernize or either go into investing in new, in new technology, which, which obviously allows then for AI um, you know, capabilities. Just, on, just maybe a comment of where, where do we start in AI? Um, what is, you know, looking at it from an SME to a, a large organization, but also for an organization that's really, you know, that has five or six, seven people that's a startup and want to also utilize AI, you know, so, yeah. Great, thank you, Abdul. Um, also, I have that video, I can either uh, share it or I can send the link. So just let me know after I've answered your question. Um, but uh, businesses are quite complex entities. Uh, sometimes the smaller ones are a bit easier to, to um, define. Uh, but mo a lot of the time they're, into, they're, they're speaking with various different touch points from the uh, suppliers, customers, uh, community. And like you said, they have legacy systems and they're looking to scale in this new AR solution and where, to, where do they really start with it? I think it's important to not just add AR randomly to say that uh, it might add be a value add to say, uh, or main, uh, um, in terms of mainstream understanding, add AR to your business and say, uh, from a marketing perspective, we're doing AR now. But um, I think that's not actually where, where the real value lies. The real value lies in uh, perhaps augmenting what your business currently does well. So figure out what that is. Uh, if it was taxi cabs before Uber, they could have embraced like, technology to allow them to become the AI. If it was Blockbuster before Netflix, they could have embraced the new technology. I think we, call, we have to embrace the change that is here. The AI tools are here, very available and quite easy to use. In fact, um, no longer do you need, I mean, there are aspects where you do need to speak to data scientists and where I work with a lot of consultants where um, we need spe uh, specific um, requirements. But so many services from, whether it's the Microsoft and uh, cognitive services through, through to Google or AWS, they're all fantastic offerings that allow you to pretty much uh, build solutions uh, that can strengthen your company's uh, value add to their customers directly. Um, I'm happy to give examples of that later, but I don't want to stretch yeah, too long. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thanks for Greg. Thanks for that. Um, Derek, I'd like to maybe uh, pose a question to you. Um, I, I think the adoption for, for AI is quite, um, you know, in terms of the benefits, you know, for, you know, ag agility, increased operational efficiencies, um, as well as, um, you know, increased um, costing and cost efficient on the business. Um, just, on, just on the strategy, I, I, I know Discovery has done a lot in AI, especially in a very good position in terms of data. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a cl I'm a customer from, from, uh, from Discovery as well. So I understand, you know, being a Discovery uh, client would be that you, you've got your medical information, you've got insurance information. I know you've also, you know, recently or past two, few years now uh, implemented telematics within the insurance sector. Um, how have you, what is the approach from a strategy perspective? How have you focused on, and data is, is basically uh, the key ingredient of, of getting AI to, 
to um, you know materialize. But where where have you started? Um, and give us some insight in terms of the strategy. And you know, has it been tough complexity based on certain businesses, or have you have you approached the the strategy? And what are the key core elements? that you, you know, can just help us to understand a little bit uh, of your approach from a discovery perspective, Greg. Hi, Abdul. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for having me. Um, I think you, you know, you're quite right. I think financial services in general, and particularly in the insurance sector and discovery is certainly no exception, have really been uh, you know, involved on the data science side of things for many years. Uh, and a lot of that's just because uh, insurance companies, generally speaking, are, are run by actuaries who uh, I think is a very close affinity between actuaries and data scientists. Yeah. Um, although they're not exactly the same thing, but um, uh, as a consequence, you know, we've been collecting data now for 25 years or more. Um, and we have a very rich data set. It's not necessarily a very big data set in global yeah. terms, uh, but it's a very rich data set in terms of the information that we, we have about, uh, about our customer base. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we uh, really said, uh, you know, what is the next step in the evolution of that data set and how do we use it uh, to provide, you know, additional benefits to our members, uh, to find uh, new avenues for efficiency in our business, uh, and also to combat fraud and, and other security yeah. problems. And those were really the main things we wanted to look at. And what we decided to do was to establish a central data science lab across all of our business units. And in building out that lab, there really are four skill sets that, that we look to uh, develop. The first one is uh, obviously the data science side itself. And in that regard, we were quite well endowed naturally and probably less of a struggle for us than most other companies. The second was really to build out the data engineering capability. And, and that was to make sure that the data that we had was in the right format, uh, that we were implementing privacy controls in the, in the right way, um, and that we were really able to you know, deal with data in the timeframes we required and at the volumes that we required. And that's been more of a struggle, actually. That's been, I think, one of the hardest things to get right. The third element was uh, to look at the underlying infrastructure. I think most of the other panelists here are looking very heavily at cloud technology. Uh, uh, because of regulation in the financial services sector that until very recently has been quite hard, particularly for personally identifiable information. Uh, there, there's some types of information we do use cloud processing for, uh, but for PII information, uh, given financial services regulation in South Africa, it's been great to frown on by the regulators to take uh, PII data to offshore uh, cloud providers. And it's still in a bit of a gray area. And if you want to, we can maybe discuss that. And then the third area, which I think Renee uh, eloquently uh, tabled earlier on, was to make sure that the whole ethics uh, approach around data and the use of data was in place. Uh, so we built that out about six or seven years ago. We're now in the second iteration of that or the second phase of that. And the second phase for us largely is about using that data now in real time. Uh, so the first phase was largely about static models that would give us uh, indices that we could then use. Now we're integrating that into our servicing and sales processes uh, in real time. And that really uh, requires a lot more compute capability that requires you know, much better event processing, uh, you know, better data pipelines. And the second phase is also about uh, you know, starting to use uh, AI to deal with unstructured data. Um, and it's also something we could potentially have a little bit of a look at. Mm. Great, thanks Derek for that. I, th I think um, in terms of your strategy going forward um, around AI, are you, are you focusing on you know, extending just the data, you, you kind of have your data structured. What is, what, what, is your, what is your plans after, you know, linking all the banking, insurance, medical information? Are you trying to focus more on getting customer information, knowing more about your customer so you can respond better from a customer experience perspective? Because that's one of the advantages of AI, right? In order to know your customer and respond and know what they want and which product you can you basically can cross sell to them or actually offer them based on their personality and based on their requirement. Yeah, I think first of all, let me say that one has to be very careful with, uh, with AI and with data in particular. Um, you, 
every one of the discovery businesses, you know, health, life, short-term insurance, banking, et cetera, is independently regulated. And uh, we have to get uh, uh, customer or members, the term we prefer, uh, permission to actually share health data with the life business, you know, or life data with the short-term insurance business. So the, the first thing is that one has to have your uh, control over your data, you know, very well um, understood and, and your processes around it very, very robust. Uh, so with Popia now, you know, we have to allow customers to uh, ask to be forgotten across all of our businesses or selected parts of our business. So we can't, uh, you know, use data quite in the way that you might envisage. You know, a lot, a lot of people from the sure. outside think Discovery's got all this data, we do whatever we want with it. Um, that's actually not true, right? So uh, we, we do run indices with anonymized data. Okay. And customers give us explicit permission yeah. Uh, we actually do provide some of the services that you're referring to, okay. um, but we do need their buy-in. So Absolutely. actually a lot of focus over the last little while has been uh, to see what we can do with anonymized data. I see. And looking at various types uh, of anonymization, we actually last year uh, implemented a tool called Privatar, uh, which gives us a much more robust type of anonymization of the data that's much harder to reconstruct. Um, and that has allowed us to share data more widely with uh, our data scientists to develop, um, you know, non-specific indices uh, on the back of that data. Sure. So a lot of the focus, as I mentioned now, is actually to get that integrated into re in real time into our servicing environment. You know, we would like, for instance, from speech um, uh, to text technology, uh, to be able to, in real time, determine whether a member might be, uh, you know, unhappy based on their conversation sure. with a servicing agent, uh, or may have a high propensity to cancel certain products, or maybe looking for certain new capabilities that okay. an agent maybe hasn't been able to talk them through. Um, so a lot of it at the moment is not AI all by itself, um, but it's AI integrated into the normal sales and servicing channels to really augment human capability. Um, so to prompt an agent to take a, a, um, a member down a particular journey based on what that member is saying uh, or to, uh, you know, really determine that, uh, that a member might be, uh, you know, going through particular difficulties, maybe in our case, maybe sick, uh, you know, may have gone through a particular life changing event and need certain types of support. So you know, a lot of that, that real time integration is actually for us where the, the bulk of the interesting work and the challenge lies mm. now. Okay. Um, event-based models, etc. Okay, thanks for that, Derek. That's very insightful. Um, I think just to give you some idea, I've, I've looked at some of the research around IDC, um, and they predicted that the spend for AI amongst Africa and Europe um, is on a 20-40% increase. So that's quite interesting that the budget is still there, um, and there will be, will be um, projects within that space. It's just about how you do the projects. What I'd like to talk a little bit about is some of the roadblocks and some of the challenges around AI. Here's a couple, couple of things, right? Um, security, ethical consideration. With, with a lot of companies moving into the cloud space right now, security is becoming really, really difficult. Um, ethical considerations, you know, in terms of being responsible, accountable, having transparency. You know, those are the, the key aspects right now, um, especially, you know, going and implementing AI within respective organizations. Maybe, maybe between Greg and Kevin, um, if, you, if you could maybe you know, give your insights around this, because this is gonna become the biggest issue right now. If we don't do it correctly, um, AI is there, the technology is there, but if we don't implement it correctly, um, and we don't have the support of, of uh, you know, probably a culture and top management around having it done in the right way that's gonna support the business, we're not going to get the value. We're really going to have a solution that's going to be, you know, managed incorrectly. So maybe, maybe, you know, some insights around that, Kevin, maybe, and then Greg on your side, if you can jump in as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions from a technological point of view is no different to implementing any other um, yeah. technology in your business. So you have to take um, into consideration the security components of it. Uh, you have to take into consideration the, the sensitivity of the data that, uh, that you're dealing with as well. And I, I, I certainly 
do agree with um, Rene's presentation in terms of the, the risk with biases that come into this. And all of these components have to um, really be taken into account. However, I do think there's a danger um, in this as well. And I, I think many people who would listen to the, the presentations could almost become paralyzed with fear in a way and say, well, there are way too many risks to actually get involved uh, in this. They could be worried about the security, worried about um, whether the models that they are gener generating have biases that are built into it, etc. And so they might actually back away. And I think the, the key thing is to do it from the perspective of what is the business problem that you're trying to solve and then start putting in those guidelines or the guardrails around the, the process that you're putting in place. Put the governance in place. Put the understanding in place of, of what are the biases that are, that are inherent in the data that you've, uh, that you've got and how do you accommodate for those. Make sure that the environment is secure. And my, my, my view is, you know, cloud is certainly more secure than, uh, than uh, personal data centers or data centers that are that are down the road at least we know when you're dealing with the hyperscalers that they have taken a, a, a great level of base security into consideration with that that you can build upon uh, with that shared security model excellent thank you thank you for that kevin uh, gregory um, in terms of the transition of a lot of companies now moving into the into the digital side um, just on that question uh, how would you how would you approach some of um, you know, the companies to, to, to approach AI based on their transition? Uh, I, I believe AI should be part of, you, know, you, you need to have, um, uh, you know, you, you'll have legacy, you'll have challenges with AI, obviously, but you won't get to AI if you don't have a proper you know, strategy and a, and a proper kind of modernization system to actually deliver AI. So maybe just some you know, approaches around, you know, around how would you go about you know, ethically you know, creating that strategy making sure the culture is there and how, what best support would you get in, in ensuring that AI would work for you uh, and for the company? I think it's uh, really important that uh, people get educated and leaders get educated in what's possible with AI. So take, take the, the factual stuff that actually works, speak to, uh, get a, a consultant to come in, workshop for a while, teach, uh, educate them on, on what's not hype and what's real. Um, and and encourage their staff to 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 not be fearful of the technology, and then in terms of um, actually employing the the AR strategy in regards to security, um, there I, I think it depends on what your risk appetite is. There's uh, with security, there's a fine line between convenience and security, and you've got to I agree with Kevin decide. Um, with your guardrails, what what's important for you that can absolutely not um, get into anybody else's hands? You might want a hybrid solution where you have something on-prem and some of the some of the cloud, but you are doing trade-offs with that because then you are having a risk that your building might burn down, and then those documents are lost forever, which is worse. Um, so the cloud, I agree, is most of the time a, a great solution uh, for most companies, um, but I do see from what my experience is, is hybrids are also still popular where um, you've got, sorry? No, absolutely. I agree with you what you're saying. So, yeah. so where you've, where you've got um, technical staff that are in-house and able to support an in-house system with enough backing and money <laughs> to, to make sure those systems are, can actually have the same facilities as the cloud backup, that's great, but that's normally for the, your really large enterprises. For your small yeah. businesses, Cloud is a great way to get up and running for a, a initially a very cheap uh, um, sum and most of the time continuously cheap. Uh, you just have to have, have experts around you because you can mess, mess that up if you haven't got a, a good architect helping you provide solutions, even using serverless um, technology. I mean, you could spark all, if you're doing a lot of queries and you hit them all at the same time, you have to really look at what the problem is and how to best implement that when you're, when you're doing it. And the security concerns in that, uh, how can it be attacked? Employee security expert, experts. That's why I work with other consultants. I'm not a one man shop. I have to help. I have Absolutely. to get experts in their various avenues. 
just to share, thank, thanks for that, uh, Gregory. Just to share some of the feedback from IDC as well. The top four roadblocks for implementing AI technology, the top one is cost of the solution. Okay, not understanding the complete, you know, full version of what it's costing and how it, uh, how it uh, you know, uh, is structured. Second one is trustworthiness of data. You know, that's, that's one of the roadblocks that they're struggling. That's actually 26%. Um, the other third one is lack of personal skills. Um, and that includes data scientists, data, data engineers, including AI modelers. The fourth one is obviously, I'm just going to add it in there, is selecting the right algorithms, you know, understanding which algorithms will work. So those are the top four. And I think from a percentage perspective, you know, that's the top four that they did a survey on. And those are the top challenges. Um, just getting into two other aspects that I want to talk a little bit about is on top of that is the skill set. And maybe Peter, if you can just maybe come in and just you know, how do we, how do we build the skills right now? There's a lot of specialized skills. It's not easy to get those skills. Um, I know the partners are upscaling. A lot of the partners in the industry are upscaling with AI skills, but how do you, how, how does, how do, how does companies start and where do, how, how can they upskill and power some of the staff? Because a lot of the staff is obviously coming from a legacy perspective and you need to mm -hmm. upskill them. What, what is the best way? Has Genesis done that with some of the clients? What, what, what is your approach in terms of, um, yeah, so, so basically our approach is to, so exactly to your point and to the blockers is it's, uh, it is a black box to most people that's not, that doesn't understand or hasn't been in that industry for quite some time. So what we're trying to do from our side is to provide interface or access to AI in a way that's easy or um, business friendly. So um, as an example, instead of giving uh, somebody, uh, you know, a big hunk of uh, database information or just data and say, hey, go and mine it and apply um, AI on top of it. It's basically more to say, okay, we'll give you the interface to that leverages AI in the back end that's specifically designed for an outcome to which the interface is um, aimed at. So mm -hmm. as part of my presentation earlier, it was more to do with predictive engagement and that was specifically around sequence learning um, on customer journeys on your website as an example. So that's just one application of it. And then the algorithms behind that is optimized for that kind of uh, uh, machine learning outcome or journey, uh, journey analytics. But from a business, business uh, interface perspective, they're consuming the AI, but to them it's really just looking like they just, you know, they're just adding a configuration. I want to check somebody that wants to do this on my website. And then letting the, the AI do the hard work or the heavy lifting in the back end. So in that way you're getting them into the concepts and then if they want to take it further, then it's really a lot more around the, um, let's say the, the, the deeper learning of it, of how the algorithms work, how to set up your own um, uh, uh, platforms to leverage that. So it's, yeah. it's exposing it in an easy manner. So just a quick another example is um, specifically in the customer experience um, industry is to uh, Derek's point is to, um, you know, to what we call agent assist is to have AI in real time transcribing and, and, and doing nat natural language understanding to, to leverage uh, information to the agent that's pertinent to them uh, or to the call. Or in another way is to, um, from a workforce management perspective, um, for scheduling and forecasting of, of call load or of, uh, interaction volume, um, those algorithms apply. So, to this, so that's basically, so start off small and then go deeper after that. Okay. Otherwise, it, it, it becomes, um, yeah, it's, it, it becomes a really, really big elephant to chew. Uh, by, I totally by, by. agree with that, Peter. Uh, McKinsey has indicated that you have to look at the low hanging fruit first. Look at mm. the opportunity, focus on the small, and then focus on, 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 the, on the bigger picture, what you're going to achieve. I just want to touch, um, uh, Derek, on one. Thank you for that, um, um, Peter. Um, the biggest thing that's going to be a critical success factor going forward is, is leadership. And maybe I'd like to just to uh, ask Derek in terms of, you know, a lot of the CIOs right now, we're struggling with, you know, uh, leadership and actually transformational leadership is what is required. Um, especially communicating to the board and, and making them understand what this technology is about and how it can transform the business. So a question to you, Derek, in terms of leadership, you know, how, what, what should our approach be before we con conclude some closing thoughts um, of the discussion? How would you, uh, for me, it's, it's more about transformational leadership. And I know Rene has talked about visionary leadership, for, that, that's critical as well. But transformational leadership is really required, you know, for, for you to obviously talk to the board and explain to the board, this is what you want to do and this is what the technology can do. It requires a little bit of courage um, and, and some risk, 
you know, just your thoughts on that and how we can include AI as part of that leadership journey um, and how you've adopted that going forward, um, Derek. So in my experience, you know, it is big company financial services experience. Um, you know, I think boards are actually very interested. You know, I think we, we last saw this kind of interest from, you know, very senior executives in technology in the 1990s with sort of e-commerce and, you know, B2B and B2C models. Uh, and then we had, you know, the, the editor of the Harvard Business Review, amongst others, Nicholas Carr, wrote that uh, book, IT Doesn't Matter, um, or Why IT Doesn't Matter. You know, I think now we're back at a, at a point where, uh, you know, I think both executive and non-executive uh, directors are very interested in technology. I think what they're less interested in is the, you know, the detail of, you know, what it takes to actually make technology work, which, you know, as any technologist will tell you is always a bit, uh, a bit messier, a bit more difficult than people think. You know, even cloud, I mean, I'm, I'm interested to hear people talk about cloud as though it's super easy, you know, it's uh, just, have, just go and have a look at Amazon's, um, you know, uh, capabilities in the AI and data space is a bewildering array of things and how to stitch them together is really not that easy. Um, and I think boards don't really want to know that. So I think, you know, the first thing is to say, well, this is what the business could get. These are the risks that are inherent in doing this. And this is what it would take, uh, you know, from a financial perspective. And I think if you can get those three elements, you know, very clear um, and, and really, uh, you know, explain them in, in very plain English, you know, I think most boards are, are exceptionally interested in this space. I think what's a little bit harder with AI um, is then to really get the business case, uh, you know, bottled down. I mean, I think the, you know, some of the other panelists have already mentioned the need for an incremental approach. You know, at some stage, I think you do need a step change. And, you know, for a small company, that may be, you know, a few hundred thousand or a few million rand. For a bigger company, it's tens or hundreds of millions of rands. Uh, and you do need to go and do that big presentation. Um, but I think what you've got to avoid as a technologist is to, you know, wait until that happens. There's so many things that you can do quite quickly, quite easily. Um, and I think that's where cloud can really help you. Is, you know, when you're yeah. early in that innovation life cycle, yeah. uh, as long as you keep sort of PI data, it's interesting a lot of people think it's security. I, I think it's as difficult to secure in the cloud yeah. as it is on-prem. Um, so I don't think that's really the issue. I think for regulated yeah. industries, the issue is the legal jurisdiction. Yeah. If you look at the South African Reserve Bank, you know, they're quite concerned about where South African data sits and, you know, do they have the legal jurisdiction to go and inspect data centers, et cetera, mm. that, that may not be in South Africa if they need yeah. to. I think it's a bigger issue than the actual information security side of it. Um, but when you're starting out, if you can use non-PII data, if you can get your staff playing, with things that are actually in the cloud, you can quite quickly do some pretty amazing things. And, you know, frankly, nothing sells like a demo, you know, to go to an executive and say, you know, here's something I mocked up over two days. This is how it's going to work. And it's actually doing something useful. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's never been a better opportunity to do that than there is now. Um, uh, it's really, you know, a little bit of skill, a little bit of reading, you know, I think anyone can do that. Mm. I think the challenge then comes doing that at scale and, you know, doing it safely and doing with all the yeah. other things. Then I think we really have a massive skill shortage on. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the other thing that you've got to convince executives of, you know, is if we go down this route, will we be able to scale it up to a point where it makes a significant difference to our business? Correct. And technology has a long history of overselling and under-delivering. Under you know, I think you've got to be quite careful here that you don't do that. Uh, you know, I think this is a, play, a, a space where it's easy to get a demo and hard to make it work in production and at scale. Um, so you've really either got to have great partners there or have a very good strategy to build your own capability. And whilst I think they're very good companies in South Africa, brilliant companies, and I think many of them here, um, you know, I think the difficulty they all have, if they're honest, is that they've got a handful of people. You know, they're three or four Absolutely. people who yeah. yeah. know what they're doing. Um, and, you know, scaling that out uh, really is quite a challenge at the moment. So, you know, I think managing that risk for a board is important. Sure. And then also managing, you know, all the other risks, you know, security, regulation, privacy, you know, all of these good things. Mm. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, you're seeing a, a, an increase in board subcommittees being formed mm. 
that uh, you know really have strong oversight over these uh, over these areas, yeah. and really a, a strong demand now for people that can uh, you know uh, can come into those board subcommittees and translate the technology into a, a business risk. Mm. Um, you know, I'd earlier I think you had a speaker from IQ Business, and I think they do mm. a lot of work in that space as well. Yeah. Um, so to me, those are the things. You know, they're interested. So there's no problem getting the conversation. Show them some quick wins, yeah. um, and then convince them. And actually, in reality, have uh, you know your eyes wide open about what it's going to take to scale this up, yeah. um, and be quite transparent and conservative about that. Uh, you know, I think that's the recipe for getting senior management on on side with us. Thanks, Derek. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think you're spot on as well in terms of your, your, your input. Um, maybe some closing thoughts. We're running out of time, gentlemen. Um, maybe, Kevin, if you can give some, maybe a closing thought around, you know, AI and yep. how we should adopt it. And then I'll move on to Peter and to Greg, and then we can, we can close the session. Sure. Uh, just for, firstly, uh, thanks to Derek for that uh, comment about cloud not being easy, uh, <laughs> because that keeps us in business. So, absolutely. <laughs> Um, okay, so some closing thoughts from my side with AI is um, really not to just go and do AI for the sake of saying that your business is doing AI. Really, really focus on what is the business problem that you are trying to solve. Um, I, I love the incremental approach. I love with finding a, an, an in and an easy in to go through. And I would recommend things like chatbots. I would recommend forecasting um, as a great one. So if you're a company that manufactures uh, products and you need to forecast um, product availability, sales, et cetera, machine learning is a wonderful way to, to do that. And provided you've got the data, um, you, you've you've got what you need in order to do it. Uh, recommendation engines is another fantastic one. So in terms of making the ease of use, AWS um, allows you to use Amazon's recommendation engine, for example. And uh, that uh, McKinsey has shown us to, to be responsible for 35% of Amazon's uh, turnover at the moment. So if you imagine increasing your, your turnover suddenly by 35%, that is a huge ROI with a very uh, simple implementation <laughs> of technology yeah, that's already available. Okay, thank you for that, Kevin, Peter, and then Greg. Um, yeah, and uh, echoing uh, everything that Kevin's mentioned there, definitely oh. um, uh, find find the business outcome that you that you try to drive and apply. Uh, applicable AI to it, not just any AI. It, there's, there's specific applications to it that's specific to a problem that it can help solve. Um, and then I think one thing that we also need to just remember, and I think uh, companies, the workforce is sometimes a little bit scared of AI because there's still mm -hmm. this perception that AI is going to replace the human workforce. And at this point, at least not for, until I suppose there's a few leaps and bounds, that's not going to happen. It's really around enhancing the, uh, the, the, the employee as well. Yeah. assisting them in assisting the customers uh, and, and, uh, um, and training and, you know, making them happy as well uh, with that assistance. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that, Peter. Greg, your thoughts? Yes. Uh, just to uh, also reiterate what Derek was say, saying or echo it, I, I believe in the small demos with showing quick wins and then understanding that those sometimes don't scale without a decent amount of planning. So I feel like leadership should be investing into um, trying out different AI technologies specifically around the focuses of their business and inside the low hanging fruit, something that can be shown quickly and can be shown to be trustworthy to get people excited about what AI can do for them, whether it's the staff internally, helping them remove the mundane parts of their job uh, to, through to uh, the business owners where they can see operational efficiencies uh, playing out in financial gain. Uh, it really needs to be a win through throughout for everyone. I don't think it should be just uh, a money game. It should be definitely about the people. It's, uh, mm. AI should help us um, be better. Thanks. Thanks for that, Greg. And I think it needs to, uh, you know, impact both people, process and technology. And I think it has to be understood. And I think if you can, you know, encompass all of those, then I think you've got it. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we've really run out of time. Apologies for the video. I think we have some uh, problems 
uh, loading it, but you really, we can send out the videos afterwards for, for the audience so they can have a look at it. I think it just stimulates the, the discussion a little bit in terms of the leadership and the type of skill set and type of, um, you know, roles that we have to play within, within uh, the, you know, this type of industry right now and the way AI is moving towards. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed myself in this, uh, you know, exciting, uh, insightful uh, discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Jan Dieswa, yeah, all done. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Guys. It's a pleasure. Thank you.